By the conclusion of this lecture, students should have a definition of what metabolism is, be able to state the two very important laws of thermodynamics, describe entropy, number four, relate to the role of photosynthesis in how energy is captured and flows through biological systems, and number five, identify reduction oxidation reactions known as redox reactions. It's important for students to realize that chemical reactions in living systems supply two very important commodities. The first is raw material. By this we mean atoms, carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, oxygen atoms, the atoms that you encountered in chapter two. The second thing is energy. The energy that is supplied drives biological systems and this energy comes from the bonds holding atoms together, the covalent bonds in general. Over the evolution of life, biological systems have developed many different pathways for generating and dismantling the molecules needed for survival. Students are required to know the terms product, substrate, and reactant. Luckily, the words reactant and substrate mean exactly the same thing. So in this biochemical pathway that we see on this slide, uh, substrate or reactant A is converted by some chemical process into product B. It is normally catalyzed by an enzyme which can recognize the shape of molecule A and convert it to molecule B. However, when molecule B is produced, it is then recognized by its own enzyme, in this case enzyme 2, and therefore B, the product of the first reaction, automatically becomes the reactant or substrate of the second reaction. And the result is the formation of product C. And this continues through the pathway until the final molecule, in this case F, is produced by enzyme 5. So each reaction in this biochemical pathway is assisted by an enzyme. We'll speak more about enzymes in another chapter, but for now it's important to understand that enzymes speed up a chemical reaction by many, many fold. The enzymes have many properties. Amongst these, two of the most important are they permit life to take place at temperatures found on this planet. And of all the possible outcomes of a chemical reaction, the enzyme directs the formation of one or a few products the first simple takeaway message from this chapter is that cells perform two basic classes of metabolic reactions. The first class takes simple molecules and builds them up into more complicated structures. And the second class of chemical reaction takes these complicated molecules and can dismantle them into simple chemistry. A good learning aid is to understand that anabolic steroids are designed to take simple amino acids and to build them up into complicated proteins within muscles. It's important that students understand the true definition of the word metabolism. So metabolism is defined as the collection of all biological reactions that occur within a cell or an organism. Research has shown that each step in a biochemical pathway is catalyzed by an enzyme responsible for that particular reaction. Metabolic pathways are simply a sequence of reactions that follow each other. So the product of one is the substrate for the next, as we mentioned earlier. Most reactions are confined to particular locations to isolate them from other chemistry, which may interfere or complicate the biochemistry. This summary slide reinforces the concepts of anabolic and catabolic reactions. As you can see, food molecules come into the body at an intermediate size in most cases, and they can be then broken down into smaller chemical molecules, which the cell then builds back up through anabolic means into very complicated molecules such as DNA, and proteins. Another important concept here is that there is a loss of energy in the form of heat constantly whenever a chemical reaction takes place. 
Many calories are lost throughout the day in the human body through chemical processes and that energy is no longer available to perform any kind of useful work. However, some energy contained in the food molecules is used for forming more complicated molecules from simpler molecules, as we'll see. The three terms that the student must be able to differentiate are metabolism, anabolism, and catabolism. One of the truths which emerges from a biochemical analysis of cells is how complicated the interconnections are between the various pathways. Uh, this slide simply reinforces the principle that food sources at the very top are initially broken down in the digestive tract of animals into simple molecules which can then be absorbed into the bloodstream and once in the bloodstream these molecules are delivered to cells those cells then build up from these starting molecules uh, complicated structures or they may break down the food molecules further to extract energy and that energy is then used to power the cell. Let us take a deeper look into how energy is used to maintain biological systems. As we may have learned in the past, the laws of biology under which life operates are not able to violate, as far as we know, the laws of physics. So the laws of thermodynamics are paramount when it comes to living creatures. Life does create order from chaos, but does that violate the laws of physics? And the short answer is no. Order may be displayed by living organisms from simple molecules all the way up to entire communities. Most order within a cell or organism is the result of chemical bonds holding chemistry in a particular orientation. One of the hardest concepts to understand in this textbook is energy. Energy is a term defined by physicists in numerous ways. Just like the definition of life, the definition of energy does not have a simple meaning. As far as we need to know, uh, there are several facets of energy that are important at this stage. The first of these is that in this universe, energy appears in many different forms. So gravitational energy is energy associated with matter whereas nuclear energy would be energy which is associated with the decay of atomic nuclei. Chemical energy is energy invested in chemical bonding. The other important concept about energy is that in this universe, according to the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. So the energy which the universe was born with 13.8 billion years ago, will still be the same energy that exists when the universe ends in another 20 or so billion years. The second law of thermodynamics states that the degree of disorder only increases as the universe ages. Another term for disorder is entropy. So the entropy of the universe is increasing as time passes. Entropy is also referred to as chaos. So if one combines the two laws together, it is clear that the universe is progressing towards disorder, increased entropy, i.e. more and more chaos. But as we saw a couple of slides back, life is premised on order, where chemistry is manipulated so that everything has its place and there's structure and very little chaos. So is life violating the principles of physics? Is it violating the laws of thermodynamics? And again, the simple answer is no. So just to reinforce, entropy is a measure of a system's chaos or disorder. The more disordered the system, the more entropy it has. And as an overall perspective, the universe is tending towards greater and greater entropy as time passes. This particular slide reinforces the concept of entropy and time. For most objects in this universe, as time passes, the degree of disorder increases. 
And in order to restore the disorder back to some kind of organization, you must have energy input into the system. So here a messy room can only be cleaned when energy is invested in reorganizing the components. Since cells, the basic units of life, are very ordered within, cells must be violating the laws of thermodynamics and physics. Well, actually, you have to view a cell as part of the universe. So in that regard, as you can see here, the cell is connected to the universe by its environment, and a cell is not an isolated entity as such. So as the inside of the cell becomes more and more organized, as illustrated here by these green circles, even though the inside of a cell has become more organized, the release of heat energy generated from the chemical reactions is liberated into the environment, causing more chaos in that environment. So overall, the universe, because of the existence of living things, is becoming disordered at a faster rate. To reiterate, the first law of thermodynamics tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted from one form to another. So whenever energy is converted from these different forms, there is always some cost in the form of heat energy that is liberated during the conversion process. An interesting way to compare these different parameters is provided by this slide taken from another textbook. So the first law of thermodynamics simply says that energy cannot be destroyed or created. So energy before and energy after a chemical reaction will be exactly the same. The second law of thermodynamics states that even though the total amount of energy before and after a chemical reaction is the same, only a certain proportion of that energy is available for any type of work. A small fraction indicated in this gray bar is unavailable and is normally converted to some type of heat energy. So overall, as different chemical reactions transform energy from one form to the other, the amount of energy unavailable to perform work increases. Life on Earth requires a constant supply of energy because energy is dissipated as heat into the surroundings and the universe. So one mechanism where organisms capture energy from their surroundings is called photosynthesis. The sun supplies us with a constant supply of radiant energy and light energy, electromagnetic energy, and that energy can be captured by certain organisms using pigments embedded in their membranes. You may know from basic biology that almost every plant on the planet has the capacity to capture sunlight and use that energy for building more complicated atomic structure. You also need to be aware that some bacteria, as well as certain protists and algae in oceans and ponds, have the same capacity to interact with sunlight and capture that energy. The remaining forms of life depend on the photosynthetic organisms to supply a constant stream of organic molecules in the form of food. So the breakfast which you consume this morning would provide you with not just energy, but also the raw materials in the form of atoms to rearrange the chemistry within your cells and your bodies. You shall learn in another lecture that photosynthesis is a very complicated process of chemical reactions. These reactions can be broken into two simple stages. Stage one is the conversion of energy from the sun into energy carried by small organic molecules. This liberates oxygen as a byproduct. The second stage of photosynthesis takes the energy in these carrier molecules and reinvests that energy in combining carbon and hydrogen molecules along with oxygen into 
a new combination such as sugar. Thus, in a simple sense, sunlight is converted into food. From a physics perspective, we can say that the electromagnetic energy from the sun, we know as light energy, is first converted into the motion of electrons, and then that energy is further transformed into chemical bonds stored within the molecules of the food. Now that we understand the very basic properties of photosynthesis, it's necessary for us to move forward and understand how energy is manipulated. The liberation of energy stored in the products of photosynthesis is known as respiration. Respiration involves the addition of oxygen atoms from the environment to molecules such as sugar, resulting in the decay of that molecule to simple chemistry such as carbon dioxide and water. In chemistry, when molecules are combined with oxygen, we call that process oxidization. So these molecules, the sugar molecules, the products of photosynthesis, become oxidized during cellular respiration. As this question at the bottom here asks, oxygen is seldom available during the chemical breakdown of the products of photosynthesis because oxygen would lead to the rapid release of energy, thereby harming the cell with heat energy. Looking at a fuller picture of what happens between living organisms, we can see that the cycle of photosynthesis and cellular respiration are complementary. So the products of photosynthesis are used to drive the reactions of cellular respiration. And this also entails other non-organic cycles which permeate this planet. We are required to revisit some of our elementary chemistry education with respect to oxidation reduction reactions. Redox reactions consist of simultaneous oxidation of some molecules while reduction of others. In the classic sense, oxidation means the addition of oxygen atoms. However, in the general regard, oxidation reduction reactions can also involve the transfer of electrons from one entity to the other. Now, since electrons cannot be destroyed or generated, they can only be transferred. So the entity that loses an electron is said to be oxidized, and the entity that gains that electron is said to be reduced. Students need to further understand that oxidation reduction reactions can take place within a single molecule. In this particular example, we have two atoms of different elements bonding together to form a covalent bond, the sharing of electrons. However, the second atom, the one with the green nucleus, is more electronegative, and it pulls electrons closer to its nucleus within the shared covalent bond than does the red atom one. Even this tiny loss of control over an electron by atom one and the extra control of an electron by atom two can be classified as a redox reaction. So recapping very quickly uh, the different components of oxidation reduction reactions. When a substance or substrate gains electrons, it is reduced. When a substance loses electrons, it is said to be oxidized. When one substance gains electrons, another substance by definition must have lost those electrons. So redox reactions occur in pairs. Another confusing term from chemistry is the term reducing agent. So the substance that donated the electrons is considered the reducing agent and the substance that gained the electrons is considered to be 
the oxidizing agent. If you spend a few moments jotting this down, you will notice that it does make sense. This slide provides an excellent example of what we mean by intramolecular oxidation reduction. If we start at the beginning, we notice that carbon has four bonds to hydrogen. Since carbon has a slightly greater pull on electrons than hydrogen does, the electron cloud is ever so slightly centered around the central one carbon atom. So in this case, carbon is considered in its most reduced state. Now, as we add oxygen to this molecule, we remove some of the electron cloud around the carbon atom. So here the oxygen pulls electrons away from the carbon since oxygen is more electronegative. And now this carbon, compared to what it was previously, has lost some control over its electrons. So now we are moving towards a more oxidized state with reference to that carbon atom. And as we remove further hydrogens from around the central carbon, that carbon continues to lose further control over its electron cloud. So as we migrate further and further to the right, we end up eventually with no hydrogens bonded to that carbon, and the only atoms that are bonded are oxygen. And since oxygen atoms are very strong at pulling electrons, this carbon atom here has virtually lost all control over its electron cloud. So carbon dioxide is the most oxidized form of carbon that can exist in natural systems. That same principle is illustrated here in this slide taken from the textbook. So one last time, oxidation is loss of control over electrons and reduction is gain in control over electrons.